How are you guys tonight? Glad you're here. I'm so glad you're here. This is just so fun to be back outside. And I kind of like this spread out venue like this. Um, I don't know, even if we can go back the other way, I'm not sure that we will, but we'll, we'll see how that all goes. Um, I don't know if you brought a Bible with you, but I'm going to be in a couple of places tonight. But uh, last week, we put a pause on our series that we were calling Rethinking This Thing Called the Church. And we were on the theme of the culture of the church, and there's a pause on that, because I want to go into that a little bit more when we get back together. Uh, but it, that's all about the culture of the church, how, how we operate with one another, not, not so much how the business of the church operates, how our services come together and who leads worship and who preaches, but it's how we operate as a family, as a tribe, as what I hope is really true about us, our, our email addresses are all family or refugefamily.com. Our website is refugefamily.com. So that means we should be somewhat of a family. And I pray that that's really always true of us. And so last week, Jeff and Jonathan and Chase looked at a few of the one another's. And they really started with the big ones. There's, I think they said there's about 55 of them that are listed in Scripture that really are supposed to determine how we relate to one another. And so they really hit the big ones, the love one another, serve one another. But there's a lot of simple ones, too. And I just want to highlight a couple of them before I jump into what I want to say to you tonight. And it shouldn't take too long. Turn to somebody and say, yeah, he said that before. But um, the, the, one of my favorite ones, it's, it's so elementary. It's kind of where we start when somebody walks in the door. And, oh, Lord, make it so that we accept one another. I'm mean, very, very thankful that God accepted you just as you came through the door. When you came with your busted up and, and just kicked around life, he said, I'll take that. I've always said that God is kind of a trash picker because that's what I was. <laughs> when he got me, I was wasted. But we accept one another and we serve one another. But I love this one. And this is more entry level than anything else. We greet one another. That sounds really simple, doesn't it? And it really is as simple as a, a warm hello. Now, it can't be the hugs like it has been for a long time. I don't know when we can get back to hugging. How many of you have slipped in a hug or two in the no hug zones? Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm okay with that, as long as you're not giving me anything but the hug, right? But but it's it's the greeting. It's the, you're welcome here, and I'm so glad to see you. And I want to encourage you to do this when we're leaving. You can greet on the way out, too, you know. It's just making somebody aware that you're glad that they're here. And it and it is with a smile, a genuine smile. And, and it is with a, a genuine happy fist bump or the high five or the ghost hug or the uh, the, the air hug. But it's so important that we do that with one another, that we embrace one another. Let's make those one another's common around here. Amen? Let's, let's make them the, the, the thing of our culture, that we accept one another, love one another. Well, we got a bunch of questions to answer this, uh, this summer. And, uh, and here's the questions that we're going to be looking at. Uh, what is the meaning of life? That's what I'm talking about tonight. And uh, then next week, can we trust the Bible? And then I'm just going to read them on down to what we're going to look at this summer. How can there only be one true faith, one religion? How can God be good? How can there be a good God that allows suffering and evil and chaos in the world? What is biblical justice? We hear a lot about justice today. What, did, what does it mean to show justice? What is biblical justice? Why can't I live however I want to live as long as nobody gets hurt. How many of you have heard that question before? As long as I'm not hurting anybody, why does it matter? Um, is there any hope for this world? How many of you have been asking that one? Is there any hope for us to get back to peace? And it's not just our nation. It's all the nations of the world right now. Does religion hinder morality? Isn't Christianity oppressive and restrictive? And the last one we'll look at at the end of, uh, end of August is how can a loving God send people to hell? That's a huge one. But right now, tonight, I want to talk about the meaning of life. Uh, th this is actually the second question in the, the typical big three themes in any philosophical discussion. You go to philosophy 101 and you're going to be dealing with these three questions. Question of origin and question of purpose and questions of destiny. Questions are posed more like this. Where did we come from? Well, that's the origin question. In other words, how did we get here? Second question that I'll talk about tonight is why are we here? 
here we are, so why are we here? Is it anybody's best guess? By the way, I, I put this into uh, um, you know, a, a search today, just uh, what is the meaning of life? And one of the first things that popped up was some comedians' takes on why is their life and some pretty crazy songs that people wrote about this, some comedy troops. But what, what is the purpose? Why are we here? Third thing is this, what happens when we die? That's a huge question. In other words, what's our destiny? How many of you think you're going to live here on earth forever in the body you're in right now? Anybody kind of happy that you're not going to be in this body forever? Anybody got aches and pains you wish you could get rid of right now? No? Yeah, okay. You're, it hurts too much to raise your hands to put your hand up for it probably. Well, many believe that there is no inherent or obvious meaning to life. Um, that, that, that nobody has the right to tell us what the purpose of life is, whether it's proposed or identified or even expounded upon by God in the scripture. Many people believe there is no reason. You can't find any book that will really give you a satisfactory reason why we're here. Those who believe that will impose their own meaning of life, or they'll just settle for a lack of meaning in life, period. They said there just is no no purpose. There's no way to get a foundational reason for why we are here. So just pick, take your own best shot at it. Well, our conclusions on the question of the meaning of life are either going to lead us, listen carefully, your conclusions will either lead you to a place of hope or a place of hopelessness or despair, or maybe to what you could call a position of acquiescence. That means you just get to a, poise, a point and you say, oh, whatever. One, one purpose, one stated purpose is as good as the next one. And you'll run down that road until you crash into the big block wall at the end of that cul-de-sac. Because it really doesn't lead you anywhere. That, oh, whatever conclusion, whatever works for you or whatever gives you what you're after, what, whatever gets you through the day or, as they say, through the night, just wrap your arms around that or whatever puts you at the head of the class or the top of the heap, you just choose your purpose for life and why you're here. Most human beings probably, though, don't have those kind of deep, complicated, philosophical conversations on the meaning of life. In fact, there's probably some of you sitting here that never really gave it a long period of thought. Why am I here? And you just gone about your life. They don't spend their days and their years searching for their purpose. And for most people, their lives are simply some kind of a pursuit of something. Now that's probably true for every one of you that are still alive because the people that give up on that give up on everything. You're in pursuit of something. Billions of people today, I'll tell you what they're in pursuit of. Billions of people, somewhere between 2 billion and 3 billion people on this planet, their purpose every day is to simply acquire enough food to survive. The profoundly poor, Every day, they're looking for something to fill an empty belly or safe water to drink, somehow finding enough food to get along for another day. The same pursuit that I saw today, not in people, but I was walking in the morning down Hyle Avenue, and I, I come up getting close to uh, Graham. You guys around here know what that is, but I was close to Graham, and I saw these two birds in the middle of the road, and they're pecking at something. And when I got up close, they were pecking on a rotting fish. They were fighting over a dead fish. Not just a dead fish, but a putrid, rotting fish. And you know what they were doing? They were just in pursuit of enough to survive. Because they, they get the, the gut pain as well when, they're, when their gut is empty. And a lot of people are on that same exact pursuit. Those two big black birds in the middle of the road just trying to get their hands around, or their beak around it before the other bird could get their beak around it. And it doesn't matter, all animals share those same drives. Even the, the, the animal part of us, the part of us is just bio biology. It's the same pursuit. Whether it's a, two birds in the middle of the road or a pride of lions on the African savanna, or, or you and I, we all have these same drives that make us search for what we need to survive. And this is all true. Most of them, you don't even think about it because you know, as soon as I'm what? Just a little bit hungry or not even that. As soon as it's, well, it's 11.55. I think it's time to eat. And no, I'm not really hungry, but I'll go and do it anyway. But for some people, that's not 
what drives them to eat. It's a deep, long, lingering pain in their gut. And they've got to find something to push back that pain, those hunger pangs. We all have the same drives, the drive to eat, the drive to hydrate, to drink. And your body tells you when it's time because you're parched and the, the desire to breathe. And you don't even think about this until you can't breathe. And we heard that gut-wrenching cry this last month, I can't breathe. A need, to, a need for shelter from harsh elements, a need, a drive. I don't know if you call it a need, but definitely a drive to procreate. And that was put in us so that the human race continues. And that drive, and this is just, a, this is a drive as well. I think you see it more in kids and puppies than anywhere. It's the drive and the desire to play, to just play. I saw a little uh, uh, Instagram video yesterday of, a, <laughs> which was so funny. There's this little monkey. And he's climbing up the palm tree. And I mean, he's really little. And mom is sitting in sort of the crotch of this, this tree. I don't know how far up she was. But the little one was going up the branch. And without even looking up, she just grabs his leg and just pulls him right back down. And when he comes down, he, he starts grabbing at her face and at her nose. And you can tell she's been through this for months already. And she's just totally unaffected. But there's something in us that loves to recreate. And I think that's just as much of a drive as what God's given us. Then there's the social drives. And we were born with these. We were born to bond with other people. We were made for community. That's probably for some of you. You wouldn't care what was going on here tonight. You would have been here if it was nothing but an open parking lot. Even without Sweet Al Coffee and without the wonderful taco truck and without the beautiful music, you would have been here because you want to be what? Together. You want to be with people that you love, people that you share a common love with. And we've got this drive to learn, so we keep buying books. Anybody got, anybody got a, a sort of a book habit but me? Let me see the, the bookies. In, well, that's a different thing, isn't it? But let me see the people that love books and, and reading material. I love it. I can't stop. I actually I had an amazing victory today. I walked all the way through Barnes & Noble and did not even buy a magazine. I need applause for that. Thank you. Without me even asking, thank you. But just, it's the drive to learn. And then there's this drive to acquire. And we've all got it. We've all got it. To gather, whether it's gathering food or just gathering stuff. We gather, we collect. We've got this desire to get. We're all gatherers. And it's, it's something in us in some way or another. Well, I want to tell you about a guy in the scripture. You know his name. He's one of the most famous. Certainly one of the richest ever. And that was Solomon. Solomon. The proverbial Solomon who wrote all those, those proverbs, or at least he gathered them. He was a gatherer. He gathered horses. When you go to Israel with me, we take you to a place called Megiddo, or we'll take you to a place called um, Hazor. And both of those were cities that were built around stables where he collected and stored his horses. He loved horses, and he collected houses, and he collected gold and silver, and he collected servants. Not everything he collected was good. He collected houses. He collected a women. That was a women, not, not just one. But he had way too many women, wives, and, and you know the story. We're in mixed company here with lots of kids. But, but he was a collector. And Solomon, I think the most noble thing that he collected was wisdom. He collected words. He collected wise words. That's what a proverb is. And many of Solomon's proverbs were his very own. Ones that he came up with. He had a thought one day and he wrote it down. And you can see that in the story of his life. Remember the story where the, the two women were fighting over the, the one baby. And they were both insisting, no, it's my baby. It's my baby. And Solomon, in all of his wisdom, he said, somebody bring me a sword. We'll just cut the baby in half and you can each have half a baby. Are you satisfied with half a baby? And, of course, the mother of the baby said, no, 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 let her have it. I can't see my eyes. Oh, he was such a wise man, such a wise leader. And many of his proverbs were his, but others came from visitors. It came from other nations far, far away. They were kings, and they were state officials and sages and magi, and they came to see Solomon's treasures. And they came to hear his wisdom. And, and they, they came to, to hear his stories. And hear all of those Proverbs and all the good ones made their way into his collection in the book of Proverbs. All the good ones made it into there. And in one of them, in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 7, Solomon said this. 
knowing that we're all gatherers, he knew that we were all collectors, we're all getters, we're always trying to get something. He said this in Proverbs 7. I'm going to read it to you in two translations. He said, wisdom is the principal thing. Therefore, get wisdom. And in all your getting, I love the way he put it, in all your getting, because you're going you're gonna to be, you, you're, you're driven to get stuff. Make sure you get something that's worth getting. He said, in all your getting, get wisdom and get understanding. Here's how the New Living Translation puts it. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment, which is the same as understanding. Now listen to, to one of Solomon's most misunderstood sayings. There's been many people that have heard this one and said, ah, no, thank you. A God that I have to be afraid of. Here's how he said it in Proverbs 9, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Say that out loud with me. The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Now, maybe it's the distance and maybe it is that 20% of you got your masks on. Can you say that as loud as you can say it right now? The fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. And listen to this. And the knowledge or knowing the Holy One, that's God, it results in good judgment. The fear of the Lord is where wisdom starts. What does that mean? The fear of the Lord. Let me tell you, because it, it's nothing to run from. It's not telling you that you should tremble at the thought of being anywhere near God because he's just dangerous. And you never know when he's just going to have an urge to haul off and smack somebody. That's not God. When it talks about the fear of the Lord, here's what it means. At its core, the fear of the Lord is about reverence or revering your creator. How many of you have ever met somebody that was really famous? And you knew you were not going to be invited home with them for dinner or to hang out with them at Disneyland. Anybody ever meet somebody famous? And how many of you felt in their presence, it was just like a sense of, oh, wow, that's her, and that's him. But think about standing in the presence of God who's invited you in and loves you and you're safe in his presence, but you know you're human and that's God. And when Solomon says the reverence of the Lord, that's where wisdom begins. To put him first and to revere him, it means to respect him. It really does. You unpack the word fear of the Lord, the reverence for the Lord, and it really does mean to respect him and to trust him in the context of a relationship with him where you know you are safe. You know that you are loved by him. I, I tell you, there's so many people that have run from the idea of God or becoming a Christian, if you want to put it that way, following Jesus, they've run from it because of an experience they had in a building like this one behind me. And I don't know what their experience was, but something got shut off when they stepped in among people who said that they were Jesus followers. And I don't know what it was, but so many people have told me this. They said, oh, I've tried that. I've tried that. Let me tell you, God isn't something that you just try. God is someone you can know. In fact, your purpose, the meaning for your life is foundationally found, is found right there in knowing him and revering him and trusting him and stepping in to a beautiful relationship with the God that made you. There is no reasonable explanation to support any idea of our existence being accidental, which means something. If I'm not here by accident, then I'm here, what, on, on purpose. I'm not here by accident. You're not here by accident. Nothing that you see is here by accident. Th that idea is absolutely indefensible, I believe. Because when you see the complexity that is in, that is in the simplest organism, whether it's biological or, or botanical, plant or animal, when you see the balance in all that, it's just undeniable that there's design behind it. There's no reasonable explanation to support an accidental origin of life, any life whatsoever. So our conclusion must be that we are here on purpose. And if we're here on purpose, then we are here, listen carefully, we're here on purpose. It means we're here for a purpose. Look at the person next to you 
and without um, shedding any virus on them, say it quietly if you need to. Tell them this. You were purpose made. You're purpose built. Erica, you are purpose built. You're purpose built, Stephen. You're purpose built, Tom and Leslie. You were made on purpose by God for a reason. This is one of my favorite little uh, things in my office. Anybody know what it is? What kind of menorah? What kind? A Hanukkah menorah, yeah. That means it's, it's, it's for what? For Hanukkah. It's got nine uh, places for candles instead of the seven. I love this thing. This was purpose built. This wasn't built to crack walnuts. I won't use it for that. This wasn't built to discipline my kids. I would never use something like this for that. This wasn't, this was built for one thing, to be a candle holder. It was built for celebration. You were built for a purpose. This guitar back here was built to make beautiful music, not to chase dogs away from your, for, from your petunias. It was made to make beautiful music, and you were made for a purpose by God. You were purpose-built. God made everything he made with a purpose, and that obvious purpose leads to the conclusion that if there's a purpose in me, then there had to be a purposer. There had to be a maker who made us. Psalm 100, verse 3 says this, We did not make ourselves. We are his people, and uh, who knows? Anybody know where it goes from there? We are his people and the sheep. Can I hear the sheep talk for a moment? Bah, thank you. We're the sheep of his pasture. We're built, we're made for him. So since we were made, the question follows, can we know our maker? And Jesus answered that question. I'm gonna throw a couple of verses at you. You can look them up later or listen to this later. It's being recorded. John 17, Jesus is praying his heart out the night that he was betrayed the day before he died, the evening before he died. And he's around that table at the Passover supper. And as he's praying, he says this, Oh, Father, this is eternal life. Any of you ever wonder what eternal life is all about? Here it is. Jesus said, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you've sent. That's what you were made for. See, if, if, if that's true, then the wisest thing that we could do is get to know him. Jesus said, this is eternal life. The only way you're going to know life the way it was meant to be was to know the father and to know his son, to know the father through the son. And I want to conclude this question of ours tonight on purpose, this meaning of life, by going back to the very beginning. See, if you want to know why we were made, listen to what God had to say on the day that the first of us were made, Adam and Eve. He takes that first man, that first woman, he puts him in the garden, and he's got a few words to say to them. Now listen to this. This is so good. In, um, in verse 26 of chapter 1 of Genesis, listen. God said to, the, uh, to himself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, having a little conversation up there. In heaven, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness, and let them have dominion. Everybody say dominion. All right. Let them have dominion. That means rulership. Let them be in charge over the fish of the sea, and, and over the birds of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. There's something that's revealed in the man and the woman together that reveals the heart of God. Man didn't have it all by himself and the woman didn't have it all by herself. But together we reflect something of the, the full character of God, the image of God and the way he made us. And then it says this, <laughs> then God blessed them. And I wonder if he sang that song we just sang. Lord bless you, and it would be, I bless you and I'll keep you. And make my face shine upon you. I'll get carried away with that song. I love that song. He, he says, then God blessed them and said, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth. Not just the coastlands, but fill the earth and subdue it. In other words, you're in charge of the earth too. 
have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, and every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, see, I've given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for food. <laughs> Can I tell you this? honestly? Before I came to Jesus, that verse that I just read was the only verse in the Bible that I knew. And the only part I cared about when I was a hippie was the part that talked about the herbs that he had given us. And yes, I think we've abused a lot of things that God made. He made everything with a purpose. But honestly, that's the only verse I knew in the whole scripture until somebody told me God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son. He said, then he says in verse 30, also to every beast of the earth, to every bird of the air and to everything that creeps on the earth to which there is life. I've given every green herb for food and it was so. And then God saw everything that he had made and indeed it was so good. And so the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Do you, do you see what we just read? God said, I have made you. I have made you for such a purpose, for such a, a high call. I made you like myself, which means that we've been made with the ability to have a relationship with God. And there's somebody here tonight that you don't have a relationship with him yet because you haven't accepted his proposal. This Saturday, I have to do one of the hardest things that any man ever has to do. I have to give away my daughter to some guy that's won her heart. And I've got to walk her down an aisle, and I hope it's about a 10-mile aisle. I would love to walk for a long ways with her, but it's going to be short. And i got to hand her over to him. And they're going to go off into their life together. But, we were, but, but here's, why, here's why they're getting married, because he proposed and she said yes. And God has proposed to you. Here's the proposal. He says, let me forgive your sin, and let me fill you with life. And let me fill your life with joy. And let me give you a specific purpose for you in which you can serve me for the rest of your life. And, and, and you haven't accepted that proposal yet. There's somebody here tonight that probably hasn't said, yes, Lord, that's what I want. I want the burden of my sin lifted. I want my sin forgiven. I want the darkness of my soul just shattered with your light. And I want to live the purpose you made me to live. And tonight you can do that. You can respond to his proposal. And you can enter into that betrothal with the lover of your soul, Jesus. God so loved you. The Bible doesn't say that God just had the job to do and so he just went ahead and he did it. He loved you so much. He sent Jesus. We're made to, to know God, this basis for relationship made in the image of God and made to, to care for the earth that he gave us to fill the earth, the whole earth, and to care for the earth and even the critters. Now, there's, there's one take on the purpose of man that the reformers 500 years ago, they, they phrased it like this. They said the real purpose or the chief end of man, as they said it, is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's true. That's kind of a cool way of saying it. But possibly based on, on Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and maybe Revelation chapter 4, verse 11. Listen to it. Where it says, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created everything. And this is so beautiful. For your pleasure, they were created. You were created to bring God pleasure. It was for his pleasure. Another translation puts it like this. It was by his will that he created us. But I love that translation that says, it was, he was so pleased to make you. Why? Because he knew the possibility of intimate relationship with him. And let me ask you, is that missing in your life? Intimate relationship with God? Are you living up to your purpose? Your purpose is to have an intimate relationship with God, to be a light bearer in this world for him. But, but a lot of you are like this, this candelabra, this, this menorah. There's no light in it. And I don't have the candles in it. And you're like, your life is like a lightless candlestick right now. And he wants to turn on the light. He wants to, to, to touch you with his fire and light your life. You were made for his pleasure. He loved making you. 
for friendship with him. Moses and Abraham, I love how they got this title in scripture. They were both called the friends of God, the beloved of God. And with all my, how many of you want to be known as the friends of God? That's what he wants. He wants to develop such a friendship with you. Our meaning in life is only going to be fulfilled as we draw near to our God. Uh, I want to read one last passage to you, and then we're going to close. This is in Colossians. Whoever's coming up to do the last song, you guys can come up right now would be a good time to come. So we're ready to go right into that. Colossians. I think Paul had a blast writing this verse this passage. He says, he, Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created, including you, that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, powers, those are angelic beings probably. All things were created through him and for him. And that includes you. That means you were made by God and for God. And, and your life will never mean what it is supposed to mean until you, number one, acknowledge that and surrender your life to that, which is not really a that, it's a him. Your life will never mean what it's supposed to mean until you say, Jesus, here's my lightless life. Here's my lightless life. Here's my hopeless life. Here's my addicted life. Here's my broken life. Here's my meaningless life. Would you fill me with your purpose? Would you fill me with your love? Show your mercy to me as I surrender what's left of my life to you. Do the wise thing that Solomon told us to do. The reverence of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the trusting of God, your maker. That's the foundation of wisdom. That's why you exist. That is the meaning of your life. And we only find our purpose in his purpose. You were created by him and for him. And every other attempt to invent or impose a different purpose or to ignore God's stated purpose for your life, it will only lead to ruin and the waste. Listen carefully. The waste of the one life you get. The only life that you get. God invites you right now into that true life. This is eternal life that you may know him, the only true God, through Jesus Christ whom he sent. Your heart, as, as Jesse sang earlier, great song, Jesse, your heart can only rest in God. You won't find the peace you're looking for anywhere else. That's where the balance and the purpose and the joy that you're looking for comes from. Would you pray with me? Father, we've, we've tackled a theme tonight that philosophers have argued with for years, argued over for years. And so many of them, Lord, that argument has gone on and on because they haven't acknowledged you in the middle as the missing piece of the puzzle. Lord, it's all about you and it's all for you. We were made by you and for you, Lord. And God, I pray for somebody here in, in this outdoor congregation tonight, Lord, that I know, I know the, their heart is probably beating a little bit faster right now realizing that's what they've been waiting to hear their whole life is that they were made by you and for you. And Father, they've wasted themselves looking for purpose and meaning in other places. And God, I believe you're going to hear from them tonight as they, as they cry out to you, as they lift their voice to you for hope and for help and for forgiveness and for life. Thank you, Father. Thank you for the reminder tonight of where life begins, where wisdom begins, where eternal life is found in Jesus and only in him. Thank you, Father. Let me ask you to keep your eyes closed for a minute. Is there anybody here tonight that would say, I needed to hear this tonight. I needed to hear this. And I want the hope and I want the life that Jesus Christ gives. And I want the forgiveness and whatever else is in the category of what you know you need that I spoke of tonight. If that's you, I just want to ask you right now to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Anybody here tonight that would say, that's me down here right in the front. Anybody else? Raise your hand up high. Maybe even wave it so I can see it. Move it around a little bit if, if I haven't acknowledged yet. Anybody else that would say, yes, I want to give what's left of my life to Jesus Christ. I don't, I don't want to play around with religion. I don't want an, another deeper dose of religion. I want reality. I want Jesus. I want him to forgive me and take what's left of my life. Lift, that, lift your hand if that's you. Anybody else? All right. I want uh, those that, 
that lifted their hands to just pray this prayer out loud with me. At least as loud as a whisper. I like to put it that way because the Bible says if we call on the name of the Lord, we shall be saved. So say this out loud with me. At least loud enough that you can hear it being spoken. Say this, Father in heaven, I thank you for Jesus Christ who died on a cross for my sins so I could be forgiven. Lord, I am a sinner. I need a savior. And I want the life that you died to give me. So I surrender my life to you. The rest of my life is yours. Use me, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, that I might know you and serve you and love you with all my heart. Amen. 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 Hey, let's all stand together and sing this last song. It's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I believe you are the way the truth the light The life I believe, I believe you are the way, the truth, the life. I believe you are. How many of you are glad that you came tonight? Anybody? Now we have a we have a spot set up here for prayer. Is that right over there? Somebody tell me. It's over here, right there. Uh, so anybody that needs prayer tonight, if you need prayer for healing, if you need prayer for just you want to talk some more about what all of this means, you got questions that you you'd like to talk through with somebody, please go right over there. But can you give me a D chord? Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give. Okay, now we're going to do it again. And you're free to turn around and look somebody in the eyes. Those eyes would be just above their mask if they're wearing it. And cast a blessing on somebody before we go from here. If you want to hang out and help us take the stuff down, that would be fine. How many of you are going to come back next week? Ready for next week? I am too. Um, we're still working on some of the artists for the uh, for the evenings, but they're filling in. Scott Cunningham's going to be coming. Chris Lazada is going to be with us. Andrew Messenger, who was here uh, last year, is also going to be with us. And uh, Hans, uh, Hans Ives from... Uh, Harvest, their worship leader, his daughter Mary is going to be one of the artists. So they're all filling in. You won't be disappointed every night. But let's sing this one more time. The Lord bless you. Here we go. The Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you. And give you here's the easy part. Amen. Let's sing it. Amen. 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 Again, thank all of you. Thank you, Grace, for bringing out the, the coffee and the pastries. Great chai latte, by the way. That's really, really good. So check out Sweet L down the street on, on Warner. Lord bless you guys and keep you. Let's serve Jesus out loud and forever. Amen. God bless you. 
This has been a presentation of Refuge Calvary Chapel Huntington Beach with Pastor Bill Welsh. For more information about our ministry, please visit refugefamily.com or call 714-891-9495.